Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special episode of Sports Legends of the Carolinas. I'm Scott Fowler, your host and a sports columnist for the Charlotte Observer since 1994. And today I'm happy to have former Davidson basketball coach Bob McKillop with us, twice. This interview is the first, and so far the only one for this podcast, that was done in two parts. The first time I spoke to Coach McKillop was in May, after his 33rd college basketball season at Davidson had concluded with an NCAA tournament appearance, but before he had retired. If you listen closely to this interview, though, you will hear hints of McKillop already planning for a future without coaching. There's simply not a more congenial spot for happy ever after living than here in Camelot. So uh, uh, when that happens, that uh, I'm not the best to play the role of King Arthur, I'll step aside. Less than three weeks later, a press conference was called at Davidson, and it was there that Bob McKillop announced he would be retiring at age 72, replaced by his son, Matt McKillop. Bob McKillop also graciously volunteered that day to redo this interview, since he knew that, as we say in journalism sometimes, events had overrun the story. If I proclaim that uh, we're a program constantly in the quest for excellence, I've, I've got to live that message. To hear that exclusive conversation, which is part two, please consider a premium subscription exclusive to Apple Podcasts. In the meantime, here's part one of our conversation with Bob McKillop, where he talks about his storied career, including taking one of his Davidson teams to a former concentration camp in Germany and recruiting a baby-faced shooter named Steph Curry straight out of a Charlotte high school. Bob McKillop, next on Sports Legends of the Carolinas. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you, Scott. A delight to be with you. Let's start because you have had a, a, a remarkable history. I'm not sure a lot of people know you pre-Davidson. So tell me a little bit about growing up, where you grew up, how you grew up, et cetera. I grew up in uh, South Ozone Park, Queens, New York. My dad was a New York City cop. Uh, my mom was not a high school graduate. She was a homemaker, a wonderful mom and housewife. Uh, I went to Catholic grammar school. Uh, when the police were allowed to leave the city in 1962, Mayor Bob Wagner said cops and firemen no longer had to live within the five boroughs. Uh, my family immediately moved to Long Island. I went to Chaminade High School, uh, an all-boys Catholic high school. And growing up, uh, my best friend, the guy I was with every day, was uh, the legendary All-American from South Carolina, Kevin Joyce. And in the senior year... We were in the same league, uh, the same Catholic league, had Kevin Joyce and Brian Adrian was on his team, a great Davidson player. Jimmy Laranega was on the team, the coach of Miami. Uh, Brian Mahoney was in the league uh, from St. Agnes and a legendary player at Manhattan and a former head coach at uh, St. John's University. Uh, Jackie Bruin played for Powell Memorial and Jackie was the head coach at Colgate University. And uh, Jimmy O'Brien, uh, the great coach at uh, Ohio State and Boston College, uh, played at Bishop Lachlan. So I think there were five Division I coaches from that same class. Uh, at the end of my senior year, I was going to go to Siena College uh, on a bit of an academic scholarship, and I had no basketball scholarships. I was working out in, um, every Saturday at Archbishop Malloy with Kevin Joyce and Mr. Jack Curran, uh, the Hall of Fame coach, uh, approached me and said, uh, where are you going to school next year? And I said, Siena. He said, how would you like a scholarship to East Carolina? Mm -hmm. And I, I was shocked and blown away. And He made one phone call, and Coach Tom Quinn brought me down on my first airplane ride. <laughs> um, and he actually tried me out. And during a tryout, I got into a fight and got like four or five stitches that they couldn't take me to a doctor. So the trainer did it because they couldn't have a record of any kind of medical issue because it was an illegal tryout. Why did you get into a fight and a tryout? Uh, one of their starting guards was a little bit aggressive and I became aggressive. And one thing led to another and we hit each other. <laughs> so uh, uh, I had the stitches and... Uh, as I left, uh, flew out of Rocky Mount back to LaGuardia Airport, uh, Coach Tom Quinn offered me a scholarship. So uh, 
You must have liked the toughness. <laughs> as the son of a city cop, uh, getting a college basketball scholarship was uh, a dream come true for me. And uh, I played two years at East Carolina. And my last game at East Carolina was in uh, 1969. Uh, uh, the court at the old Charlotte Coliseum against Davidson. Uh, I guarded uh, Dave Moser. Uh, we lost 91-72, and uh, Davidson went on to uh, uh, play in the NCAA tournament. They finished in the Elite Eight that year. And at the conclusion of that game, as they had the celebratory uh, experiences of uh, giving out the trophies and all tournament team, uh, the Wildcat Club drove a I think it was a, a white or blue Thunderbird onto the court of the old Coliseum and gave it to Lefty as a gift for uh, <laughs> just another great year as a coach. As a coach, and uh, uh, I, I just was a very young, immature kid who felt very much uh, homesick. So that's why I transferred to Hofstra, and uh, that's where I played. I sat out one year and then played my final two years there. What was your style as a basketball player? Uh, I was a playground player. Uh, I did not have a great IQ. I had very good toughness. Uh, I was more of a scorer than a shooter. Uh, I, I took playing defense very personally. Um, so I was just, uh, you know, a guy who competed and competed very hard. Were you a point guard? I was a point guard, but back in those days, they didn't really call you point guards. They just called you guards or forwards or a center. So I was a guard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you honed your game at a place called Prospect Park, I believe. Uh, is that right? And tell me sort of about the sort of this playground uh, mentality that sort of, uh, I, would, I would assume, toughened you up. Prospect Park was about uh, a mile Maybe, uh, we, and we never talked about miles back in those days. We talked about blocks. It was about 20 blocks from my house and Kevin Joyce's house. And Kevin and I would each have a basketball and we'd dribble to Prospect Park and we'd get there and it wasn't open yet. It was a brand new park and it had a beautiful macadam surface, pavement surface, and it had uh, outstanding baskets. It had nets. We never played with nets before. And uh, to, to be able to play in that park, I, I think we must have dribbled all of those blocks for four or five or six times before we found it to be opened. So it became our, we, it was, a, it was a, our court. Mm -hmm. And in those days, um, you'd play full court very rarely because everyone wanted to play. And if you had two baskets occupied by full court, that's 10 plays. Whereas you could play four on four in a half court, and that's 16 players. But one court at Prospect Park was reserved for full court. And night after night after night, games began at 6.30. And if you lost, you might sit for an hour. Oh, geez. And uh, you had this mentality that developed and was nurtured and cultivated there called a stay-on mentality. You want to stay on the court. And it became a... Uh, a focal point for Long Island basketball. And uh, I always had the fortune of having Kevin Joyce on my team, and we were able to stay on the court quite frequently. Uh, but great players would show up. Uh, I, I can recall Julius Irving. I can recall uh, Tommy Riker. I can recall Ernie Grunfeld. Uh, there, there were so many great players on Long Island back in those days that uh, it became a, a, the place where the action was. And he, everyone would always say, where's the action tonight? And it was Prospect Park. And living right across the street was a young kid who used to watch the games. And in between games, he'd go and shoot on the baskets. And that was Matt Darty, who <laughs> eventually became the high school All-American at Holy Trinity. And, of course, the uh, coach at North Carolina, Notre Dame. And uh, now a resident here in uh, Mooresville, North Carolina. And you coached him as a, as a high school coach, but I believe I read somewhere that you said y'all didn't really let him play at Prospect Park. You sent him to the deli sometimes. Well, that was when he was the young boy, and right across the street was his home, but it was also the dairy barn. And he'd go and get us, uh, you know, 32-ounce bottles of cot soda or orange juice or something in between games. And uh, he was only 9, 10 years old at, at, at that time. Got a lot better. Yeah. Well, he certainly did. Was, <laughs> and he, he, being across the street, he would labor feverishly to improve his game, and he'd watch and watch and watch. Interesting story about Matt. Um, 
When he went to the camp at Long Island Lutheran, where I eventually ran the camp, Matt brought a notebook, and he would take notes whenever there was a lecture and kept a running notebook about things that were said during the lectures at the basketball camp. Really? Hmm. When did you know you wanted to be a coach? Um, when the New York Yankees said I wasn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I always dreamed about playing center field for the New York Yankees. Oh, so but baseball was even more of a love. Huh? Yeah, so you were playing high school baseball high too, High school right? baseball, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the Yankees just didn't know who I was. <laughs> I dreamed about it, but they didn't know who I was. Uh, I, I did have the fortune of uh, uh, getting offered a contract with the Mets uh, for $500 a month to play in their Class D team. Really? And back in those days, they had triple uh, A, double A, single A, B, C, and D. So it was at the lowest of the lowest echelons of minor league baseball, and it was for $500. So I weighed the two options, $500 a month for the summer with the Mets or full scholarship to East Carolina University. And then from Hofstra, didn't you, I know you've, you've mentioned this story, but maybe you can tell it here. You had a tryout with the Philadelphia 76ers. Yes. Uh, that summer of 72, I signed a free agent contract with Philadelphia, $17,500. And um, so when I signed the contract, we had training camp in Scranton, Pennsylvania, at the University of Scranton. And... Uh, it was a great experience, uh, but I was released. Well, so that year, the Philadelphia 76ers was 9 and 72. <laughs> and it was the worst team in NBA history, full season team in NBA history. So if you add all the pieces together, I was cut from the worst team in NBA history. <laughs> um, Oh, gosh. Well, the 76ers weren't, uh, at least they didn't have to spend a lot of money to go 9 and 72 that year, I guess. And so from there, you went into tell uh, yeah, sort of I, continue I, on. It was interesting because um, I, I, one of the weaknesses I had was that uh, I was just happy to be there. Uh, I was willing to put on a Philadelphia 76 practice uniform and feel like I had made it. And uh, when I was cut, uh, I knew I had another job. I was hired as an assistant basketball coach and history teacher at Holy Trinity High School. And and you mentioned a third course, too, that you sp uh, taught at Holy Trinity. Yes. Uh, in, in my final year at Hofstra University, I took an elective in history called Sport and American Society by a very prominent professor, Michael DiNicenzo. And uh, uh, I proposed to the principal of Holy Trinity that this could be a senior elective. And... Uh, the principal, Father Young, said, yes, this would be a great elective. So I met with Dr. DiNicenzo again and sure enough got a curriculum. And I taught that as a senior elective, sport and American society. If you look back on that 22, 24-year-old Bob McKillop, from your vantage point now, what would you tell that young man? Um, open your eyes. Uh, open your ears. Be insatiable about taking notes and creating memories and growing and learning. Um, the world is ever-changing. There's a great need for adaptability, but there's also a great need for creativity. Uh, adaptability will feed creativity. And uh, I've tried to take that lesson. Uh, when you think you know it all, you're writing your own obituary. And uh, it was a learning experience I had to go through in order to move through my experience of life. When did you be first become a head coach? My second year of teaching at Holy Trinity. I was an assistant coach to what was my grammar school hero. Uh, I went to this uh, grammar school in Queens called Our Lady of Perpetual Help. I was a fourth grader and my hero was an eighth grader by the name of Bill Permakoff. This was the guy that everyone wanted to be like. He wound up playing baseball at St. John's University and wound up being the head coach at Holy Trinity. So he's the one who hired me to be the JV coach and assistant coach. I was there one year and Bill became the assistant coach at St. John's University in, bat in baseball. Mm. So I was able to be moved into the head varsity coaching position at Holy Trinity in my second year. So you were 23, 24? It was 1973, like so I was 23 years old. Hmm. And so what sort of 
coach were you then as opposed to now? Like how did you – your players would have been very close to your own age. How tough were you? I mean uh, – I had too much toughness and not enough tenderness uh, because of the age difference. I, I felt I really had to be a disciplinarian. And uh, as much as I cared about those young guys and as much as I stayed uh, in contact with them still to this day, uh, I, I, I could have been better to them in terms of being more aware of what their needs were. Um, but it was my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. And there was a story written um, a number of years ago about one particular player named Tim Timlin, who I locked out of the gym one day because he was late for practice and wound up making him run the next day. And then when he wouldn't run anymore, I cut him from the team. And uh, to this day, I've regretted that. Hmm. If we skip ahead a little to the Davidson years, that your first three years, which I'm sure you didn't have as much talent, but also were your losing seasons that you have hardly ever, ever had since then, was that a product of – I mean, did you change your coaching style at that point? The, the coaching style was ever-evolving for me. And, um, you know, we as coaches, sometimes when we win, uh, we think, why change? And we won in high school, so why change? When you lose, you start to become much more introspective and analytical. And as a result of the losing – uh, it, it, it forced me to look even closer about uh, the way to do things. I was brought to my knees. I was humbled. Uh, winning in high school, as we did, uh, made me a little bit arrogant. Growing up in New York and in that environment, you grow up to be arrogant because if you're not arrogant, uh, someone's going to knock you on the, the chin and, and get you to back off and back down. And I was not going to be one who was going to surrender to that. And I had a mistaken uh, toughness that became much more arrogant than toughness. Uh, so it took me to be brought to my knees by losing here in those first couple of years. Uh, and as much as I regret the experience I had with Tim Timlin, I equally regret that those first three years here in which I had young men who were just sensational in the way they did whatever I asked, but I did not have enough tenderness for them. You've mentioned before, but uh, for those who don't know that are listening, uh, you coached both of your sons here. Did that change you at all? How was coaching your own sons here? Matt and Brendan uh, both wore Davidson on their heart. Uh, they grew up wanting to be a Davidson player. Uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s, there weren't too many people who grew up from the time they were little boys to be Davidson players. Uh, so that was unique. Uh, I saw how hard they worked. Uh, I knew how much they competed. Uh, they were perfect fits for our style, for our system. Uh, but they didn't have the same kind of athleticism that some other players had. Uh, I was tough on them, very tough on them. Um, and it's a poignant story that uh, dramatically impacted me. It was Matthew's freshman year, and his roommate was Brendan Winters, the son of the legendary Gamecock and NBA player Brian Winters. And we're playing VMI, four seconds to go in the game, and uh, we have the ball baseline out of bounds, and we're down two points. Time out. I stand in front of the team sitting on the bleachers and I'm all set to call a play and I was making a decision, Matt or Brendan Winters, to shoot it. And I said, geez, if Matt shoots it and he misses, he'll feel awful and I'll feel awful as a dad as well as as a coach. So let's call a play for Brendan Winters. I kneel in front of the bench, all set to design a play and draw on the grease board and glance upward, and there's Brian Winters sitting four or five rows back. Uh -huh. The immediate thought that came to my mind in that very poignant moment was, everyone is somebody's son. 
So I wound up calling a play for Matt. He missed. He felt awful. I felt awful. But I learned an incredible lesson. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. I'm surprised I haven't asked the Steph Curry question yet. I'm going to ask you several, but before we get to that, I want to talk about toughness and tenderness, but not just that. As a former history teacher and a history lover, you have done some things with your teams that I don't think a lot of coaches probably do, including going to a a German concentration camp. I wonder if you could talk about that visit to Auschwitz, what that meant. Uh, You wrote a, a... a very thoughtful op-ed piece, I believe, for the Washington Post about it, but just why you did that. Toughness and tenderness, first of all, as a history major, I learned that was a quote from a great revolutionary, and I'm not Is that sure right? how, yeah, it was uh, uh, Che Guevara, mm. and I'm not sure if he's somebody I want to hold up and say, let's be like <laughs> Che Guevara, but the comment he made about we must grow tough without losing our tenderness was mm. um, a remarkable comment. Uh, back to Auschwitz, uh, I was approached by a Davidson uh, alum, a field hockey player, and uh, she asked me if we would be willing to take the team to Auschwitz to make the people of the United States and the people of the world more aware of what actually happened. Um, there was a survey done of high school students a small number of high school students even knew about Auschwitz. It wasn't being taught. It was almost becoming a buried uh, historical experience. And um, this particular group, uh, the, the Maimonides Ma- uh, Institute, was trying to make people aware that you know the Holocaust did happen. And we need to be aware of that. And, and we could get sucked into that same mentality again unless it's it's constantly brought forward never forget uh, so she asked if we would do it that we would be great representatives of voicing that experience uh, in a, a very public way and uh, there was no basketball whatsoever that was involved uh, I believe we left on a Thursday arrived on a Friday uh, spent Saturday Sunday at Auschwitz and left on a Monday Uh, We were guided through the tour of Auschwitz by a woman known uh, named uh, Eva Moses Kaur. Eva was one of the Mengele twins. She was the one that uh, we see in footage all the time walking hand in hand out of the concentration camp in those striped suits, a little girl holding her sister's hand as they uh, were were freed from uh, Nazi uh, incarceration, persecution, and um, she was absolutely remarkable. Uh, I think she was 84, 85 at the time. She took us around um, Auschwitz, an absolutely life-changing experience for our players. What I thought was one of the most remarkable aspects of the experience for our players to see was not so much the horror and the hatred and the uh, dehumanizing uh, that was done by the Nazis, but the forgiveness of Eva Moses Kaur. There's a railway car that sits on the track, and we've seen it many times in movies about World War II where the the train comes through the portal in uh, Auschwitz and the passengers get off and they're greeted by uh, Nazi guards and dogs and fire hoses and the violence and the screaming and the yelling. Well, she took us to that one railway car and described in great detail what it was like uh, to have that railway door opened, to jump down onto the platform. She could describe it in the most in-depth detail. Mm -hmm. It was embedded in her memory now, some 70 years later, the separation between her and her mother, the separation between her and her sister from her father and brother, uh, excruciating. And she had the ability, the grace to forgive the Nazis for what they did to her. Uh, you know, we, science explains a lot. Science can't explain that. 
And, and to me, that's uh, one of the great affirmations uh, I've had in my life about a person uh, that believes life is special, life is respectful, life is something that needs to be treated with great sanctity, that she could actually forgive amidst the horrors that she underwent. That's powerful. And this was in 2018? I, I think it was 2018, yeah. yeah. Wow. To back up a second, Coach, when did you get and how did you get the Davidson job? <laughs> I came to Davidson for one year as an assistant coach hired by Eddie Biedenbach, who is a dear friend. And um, I, I think I got the job. We were successful in high school. I was a, a five, six-year high school head coach. I had very good players. I had a sophomore that was being recruited by everybody, Matt Doherty. I also worked at a very prominent uh, training ground for great high school players, five-star basketball camp. Those were two feathers in my cap, having a young player and working five-star. Eddie Biedenbach hired me. And what's really fascinating about the hiring as an assistant coach, and this was 1978-79, Wednesday of that week that I got hired, it was September. Wednesday of that week, I was brought down to the University of Pennsylvania uh, by Bob Weinauer, who was the head coach at University of Pennsylvania, and they offered me a job. I drove down across the Ben Franklin Bridge from Long Island, rainy, there was tremendous construction on the campus of Penn at that time, and uh, was offered the job. A day or two later, I flew down to Davidson. Saturday afternoon football game, glorious sunshine, tailgate parties, played pickup basketball with Eddie Biedenbach in Johnson Gym after the football game, uh, flew home on Sunday. There was no question where I was going to <laughs> take uh, my next step. And I, so I accepted the job at Davidson. So we had quite a staff and we had, we just had such a wonderful year together in terms of a cohesive staff, but we unfortunately, we lost. We lost dismally. Uh, I was making $17,000 and uh, Long Island Lutheran approached me and offered me $35,000, so a double my salary. I went back to the president to see if I could negotiate just a little bit more and no, they, he was ironclad with his $17,500 <laughs> salary. And uh, so I decided to, Kathy and I decided to move back to Long Island, take that job. I was there for 10 years, and uh, as first as director of their summer programs and basketball coach, then as headmaster of the school and a basketball coach. I experienced a, a number of administrative experiences that uh, was a great preparation, a great learning ground for being a college basketball coach. Alumni relations, development, admissions, and obviously still coaching basketball. Uh, I had very good players. Uh, Bill Wennington, recruited by everybody. Augusto Benelli was a sensational player from Italy. And what happened during that time period was I had these players from international backgrounds that came to Long Island Lutheran, and the doors to Europe opened up dramatically. I was offered coaching opportunities, clinic opportunities, camp opportunities in the European marketplace. And back in the 1980s, that wasn't very common for an American guy to go there in coaching capacity, much more so as a player, but not coaching capacity. Mm -hmm. And it just expanded my network. During that process, uh, the players were recruited by everyone here in the country, and uh, I became very good friends with Terry Holland. Uh, he and his staff, uh, so with that bond that developed uh, in the recruiting process, uh, when it came time for the Davidson job to be opened up, and I think it was 1989, uh, Terry Holland suggested that, uh, you know, Bob McKellar's been there before as an assistant. He knows it. He played against it as a player. Uh, he's had very good success administratively, uh, program development, uh, and he's got good players and access to the European marketplace as well as the American marketplace. 
Uh, so I was offered the job. And and Terry Holland had been was the coach and was moving to AD. And well, so at was, that point, oh, at that point, nobody knew that. Oh, okay. Uh, this was in um, early May of 1989, and. Uh, when I was offered the job, uh, I was warned, advised by a number of older coaches who I had known through the recruiting process that uh, uh, the AD was not going to be retained. So I'd be getting hired by an AD who would be leaving within a month or two or three. Uh, so uh, I turned the job down. I flew with Kathy to Athens, Greece, did a clinic in Athens, Greece. Phone rings in the hotel, and of course, that, those are days when there was no cell phones. And I pick up the phone, it was President John Kirkendall from Davidson. And uh, John uh, asked me if I would reconsider. And uh, Kathy and I uh, flew home and thought about it the whole way home. And yes, we did reconsider. And came down again for a second visit, went through a number of concerns I had, and uh, went to the airport, called Terry Holland, because he had uh, asked me the last time when I turned it down why I turned it down, called him back, and I said, it looks pretty good. He says, well, uh, I just want you to know I'm going to be the athletic director next year. <laughs> and uh, it, was a, it yeah. was a home run. Huh. And I couldn't be more uh, fortunate, uh, luckier uh, to have uh, my initial years at Davidson College uh, under the mentorship, leadership of John Kirkendall and Terry Holland uh, as classy gentlemen as you could ever want to be exposed to, great representative, representatives of Davidson College as alums. Uh, I was incredibly lucky because uh, my butt could have been in Macy's window after two or three years of losing like we did. And instead, uh, encouragement and inspiration from John and Terry kept me here. What does that mean, my butt could be in Macy's window? Is that a New York expression? Yeah, it's a New York experience. Understand. Louis Conasecca used to always tell me that, <laughs> that uh, uh, you never want your butt in Macy's window because everyone's going to see you. It's going to be very embarrassing. <laughs> You began coaching here. We're sitting in, in uh, inside Davidson College right now in 1989. It's been 34 years. What is it that has kept you in this place? Um, this is Camelot to me. Uh, uh, there's an extraordinary intimacy here that allows someone who works here to uh, be married to the environment and fully embrace with both arms what the experience can be. Because it can be an experience not just for yourself, uh, but for your family. And uh, to have that kind of special environment where uh, the greatest cheerleader we could want is Kathy. Uh, the dreamers that we want to come onto this campus and, and dream of uh, taking a journey towards excellence are your three children. Um, it, it is something that is uniquely Davidson. And when you come into this environment and each year you fight through the joys and the sorrows together. Uh, it, it just builds that joy and it mitigates that sorrow. And you, be, you become a, a, a team that can then become the team that you want to coach, that then can become the team that you want Davidson to be. Uh, so it, it's family that has kept me here and, uh, is probably uh, the greatest joy that I have in being here because this family has grown incredibly large as a result of this experience. Uh, but it was cultivated, it was watered, it was nurtured uh, by Kathy and our three children. And just as an example of that, I believe you, do you walk 
to work or walk home after games? It, there's you're, you live really close to campus. I live right maybe. across the street from the campus. It, uh, we lived there since we moved in in 1989. Uh, I, I don't often walk to campus on a work day because I need the car to get from one place to another. Uh, uh, but game day, I walk to the games and I walk home from the games. That's been a 33-year tradition. Hmm. And how long of a walk is that? It's right across the street. It's uh, Five minutes. 200 yards, <laughs> 300 yards. <laughs> In my better days, I could throw a baseball twice, probably take me two throws, <laughs> and I could hit the front porch. Uh, so you had a, a life-changing player come to Davidson. America had heard about him, and now we know about him. A star on the NCAA tournament stage, Stephen Curry leads Davidson into the second round. Tell us about the recruitment of Steph Curry. Uh, it, it actually started with a mentality that we had in our recruiting process. Uh, I, we, I've always believed that genetics play a big part in development of players. So we would try to recruit the sons of ex-players and uh, had great success with that. And um, Stefan obviously... Uh, Genetics, his mom played volleyball at Virginia Tech. His father, one of the greats of Charlotte history, one of the greats at Virginia Tech. Uh, but we first became uh, friends when Stefan was a 10-year-old ten playing for the Charlotte Heat baseball team. And uh, on that team was our youngest, Brendan so Brendan and Stefan were teammates on the Charlotte Heat. They had a magnificent team. They played incredibly well. They won the state championship in AAU that year as 10-year-olds. But as we experienced every AAU weekend in the spring, were spent in uh, Burlington, North Carolina, or in uh, Gastonia. And in many occasions, you'd sp spend the night in a hotel. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday... Uh, you'd have meals together, you'd see each other at the games all day long, you'd see each other in the hallways and town shopping, whatever it might be. Uh, so we became familiar with and friendly with uh, Adele, Sonia, and uh, Steph, and Sadal, and uh, Seth. And uh, they, they became like uh, friends to our family. And as Stefan went to Charlotte Christian from there and became a, a, a very, very good high school player, uh, we immediately gravitated towards him because of what we had learned about him in the baseball playing days, but also because of the genetic aspect of the future development. And if you were to see him back in those days, and there are pictures that uh, certainly portray it this way, he was boyish, baby-faced, and very frail. And it looked at oftentimes as if he was wearing Dell's uniform uh, <laughs> Uh, so we began recruiting him, and then as soon as we could elevate the level of our interest in his junior year, uh, we'd go to his high school games and a high school practice, and then that just further ignited our interest and watched him play throughout that summer prior to his senior year. And uh, one great story is going to Las Vegas to watch him play in an AAU tournament, and Dale was coaching the team, and they were not one of the high-profile AAU teams. So as a result, uh, they did not get much attention. Not many college coaches would go attend the games, but we went to every one. And it was Matt Matheny, uh, our associate head coach at the time, and myself who went to every one of Steph games during that uh, weekend in Las Vegas. And uh, there was one particular game that convinced us. Uh, he was playing very poorly, missing shots, throwing the ball away, dribbling it off his foot. Uh, but never once did he complain because a guy didn't catch his pass or uh, smack himself because he missed a shot or not get back on defense because something bad happened in the offensive end. Even in timeouts, he looked Dell dead in the eye every timeout, fully attentive to what Dell was saying. When he was off the court sitting on the bench, he cheered his teammates on. He greeted them as they came off the court. He had every character trait as a basketball player that we recruited, and we were convinced that 
uh, despite all of the adversity he was facing in that game, uh, he never once relented in his character strengths. And we decided right then we were going to offer him a scholarship. Uh, in September, Matt Mathena, Matt Mathena and I drove to Charlotte and at late afternoon to visit with uh, Steph and Dell and Sonia in their house and uh, just explain to them uh, every aspect of Davidson, answer any question he had. And uh, before we could really get through our presentation, Steph stood up and said, I'm coming to Davidson. <laughs> and and we, we were just elated. And Matt and I uh, could have not even used a car to get home. We were flying home. Uh, we were just overwhelmed that he had made that decision at this point in the recruiting process. And, and Sonia said as we left, uh, Coach, don't worry. We'll fatten him up. And I said, we'll take him just the way he is. And we were certainly welcoming in that regard. And, uh, boy, what a decision that was to offer him a scholarship. Man, so that was around 2006, I guess, five, 2000, somewhere mid-2000s. It was, mid it was the, uh, the fall of 2005. Okay, yeah. So before his senior year, before he played it, really. Correct. So he was obviously going to, you knew at that time, was going to be a good player. I can't imagine anyone would have known you were co about to coach a two-time NBA most valuable player. This kid's amazing. Curry again. Finds a cutting Curry. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Young fella. When did you realize how special he was? Um, when he came as a freshman, we had lost seven seniors that graduated. It, it was uh, a team that was now dependent upon young players. We had been to the NCAA tournament in 06 uh, against played Ohio State and narrowly lost to them in the first round. Uh, but now pressure was starting to build. We had uh, pretty good success. Uh, we had uh, a young team, though. When we began workouts in late August, early September, you were limited to three guys to a workout. And what he showed in those three-man workouts, uh, we were just thrilled beyond belief. He was more attentive, more skilled, tougher, um, and just had such a feel and a sense, a basketball IQ going back to genetics that was as mature and as advanced as we had seen at a young player's that age. I guess it was maybe uh, the first week of October, we had an annual event at uh, uh, Myers Park Presbyterian Church in which I'd give a, a prognosis for the season. And uh, I went in that morning and it was a breakfast meeting with maybe 150 or so alums and uh, pronounced very boldly, uh, Stephen Curry is going to go down in history as one of the greats in Davidson College basketball history. And... Uh, that's how confident I was, but that's the kind of confidence that he gave you. Curry, right back with a three. Great vision, Curry. Off the window, high, and in. Is, is it remarkable? Here we are, some 15 years later, and he's still giving that confidence to Steve Kerr and his Golden State teammates. What a, a capacity for leadership that is. And sure enough, uh, he lived up to every expectation and beyond as he played here for three years. It was remarkable to watch, and, uh, and those three years were, were remarkable too. And I know the fact he got his degree 13 years that later, after he left here, he left here with one season of eligibility remaining. He was the number seven overall pick in the NBA draft in 2009. But he came back. And he managed that. He managed to get that degree. What did that mean to Steph, but also to Davidson and to the basketball program as a whole? Well, so uh, consistently part of his character, he honored his commitment. Um, a voice crying in the wilderness in our world today of honoring commitments. And sure enough, he uh, he made that promise uh, to his mom, to the Davidson 
fan base and to, to our coaching staff, I'm going to graduate. And uh, it is such a difficult thing to do, not graduate, but to do it the way he was challenged to do it, to do it piecemeal, to be out of rhythm. I, I think any success, any point of excellence in life is a process of rhythm. And he was completely out of rhythm because he could not do it in one fell swoop. He could not do it in one bite. It had to be piecemeal. And piecemeal that was uh, shared with his NBA career, shared with his marriage, shared with his three children, shared with the iconic figure he has become, the global figure that he's become. And to be able to do that uh, and, and stay in rhythm it's sort of like the way he shoots. <laughs> he, he can miss and miss and miss. And then because he's in rhythm at all times, he's going to make and make and make. And um, this was a culmination of every positive character trait that Stefan has. Uh, finish. Uh, he finished the job. He honored his commitment. And he did it with integrity. And I, I say he did it with integrity because there was a point where uh, it was floated in front of him that you can get an honorary degree because of what you've accomplished in the world as a global icon. And he wanted no part of that. Really? He wanted to earn it. Huh. And he's earned it. Bob McKillop. We all won. Thanks to Stephen Curry. There is hope in the world because of Stephen Curry. Age to you, what does that mean? What does that matter? How long do you want to keep going? Your energy level seems very high. That said, a lot of your coaching peers have retired uh, at this point. What, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I, I coach because I, I've learned. I've learned that it's an opportunity uh, to help people. So it's become sort of a ministry for me in that regard. Each day I'm given a challenge of impacting the lives of people. What a sacred trust that is. What a great privilege that is. But I've got to have the belief internally that I could do that in the best way possible. Whenever there's a point, and it will come, where I don't think I'm good enough to do the job as completely and as fully and as well That'll be the time. And um, it's interesting that at the end of each season, uh, I, I really analyze and evaluate. And I would say that many coaches believe this, that after a game and you've had a losing experience in the game, you might say, man, I'm, I'm done with this. I can't do this anymore. And then you go through the film and you're laying in bed at night, and you just can't wait to get up the next morning to make the corrections. Mm -hmm. That's been a 33-year experience for me. Uh, whenever there comes that point where it's not that I'll lack the excitement, but I'll lack the confidence that I can do that, that it, it's a point where someone better can do it than I can do it. If I honor my commitment to the excellence of Davidson College's program, then I have to be willing to step aside to allow that to happen. So whenever I have that sense, that'll be what'll happen. Roy Williams said much the same thing when he left, that he eventually, I think he said, I'm just, I don't feel like I'm doing as good a job as I used to or something to that effect. And he left suddenly. Mike Krzyzewski, another of your peers, uh, had a, instead a year long uh, time where everyone knew it was his last this and his last that. When, when that moment comes, whether it's 10 years down the road or whatever, what, which of those two paths do you think you'll choose? We are all products of our experience, and I think I've given you some insight into some of those experiences. Uh, get in a fight uh, at East Carolina when I was trying out for a scholarship, not surrendering. The stay on mentality of the park, uh, being brought to my knees uh, when we lost here in my first three years, uh, going through a metamorphosis of uh, toughness to tenderness. Uh, uh, 
everything is analytical with me from the standpoint of I think things through very thoroughly. I don't shoot from the hip. And you can take this to the bank. Uh, I'm not going to let someone drive me out. Mm. Uh, I hear lamenting about uh, the culture of college athletics today. Well, there's a lot of things wrong with college athletics 33 years ago when I stepped into it. Uh, and if anything, that's going to galvanize me even more. Uh, in short, there's simply not a more congenial spot for happy ever after living than here in Camelot. Uh, we want to be Camelot. We, we want to be different. We want to be unique. So um, uh, when that happens that uh, I'm not the best to play the role of King Arthur, I'll step aside. <laughs> Last one on uh, sort of the future, but your son, Matt, is a very accomplished assistant coach here. When you leave, do you foresee a succession pattern where he would become the next head coach? Well, he's uh, someone who has grown up with Davidson on his heart. Uh, he's someone who uh, represents everything that Davidson holds dearly and highly. Uh, he's demonstrated a remarkable capacity to, to coach, uh, to lead, to engage. Uh, so he's got the character trait. He's got the skill level. He's got the experience factor. Uh, he's been offered opportunities to leave here and has stayed behind. Uh, uh, his commitment to Davidson is extraordinary. And, you know, we have this uh, trust, commitment, and care motto, TCC, that has been with us for 30 years, and uh, it's emblazoned across his chest. Uh, and uh, I, I think he will be ready to take the, that step when it does become available. Last thing, Bob, I guess let's just wrap up by um, you deal with young people a lot and not just your players, other young people, camps, whatever. What do you tell young people nowadays like, is, is, that might be listening to this? What's most important in life? What do they need to do, do you think, to succeed? Dreams do come true. And um, you, you must keep fighting for your dream. And in the process of fighting for your dream, the best way to accomplish that is to take the journey with people alongside of you. Uh, dreams don't come true unless there's teamwork. How do you cultivate teamwork? You cultivate teamwork by trying to help people. By trying to help people, you build a foundation for that team. And through that team, you reach your dream. What is the joy of sitting at the foothill of a mountaintop that is just absolutely glorious or on a seaside watching the waves break or the smile of children walking across a field playing a game. The joy is being able to share that vision with other people. Keeping that joy to yourself is not nearly as exhilarating as sharing that joy with others. Uh, that I think is something that can only be fostered, cultivated, nurtured uh, if you care about people. So we go back to that code here of Davidson basketball of trust. Yeah, you got to be able to be trusted, commit, both feet in the door. Don't worry about adversity. Don't worry about making a mistake. Just keep your both feet in the door. And the third thing, let care be the guiding light through it all. Coach McKillop, man, he he's a big reason why I have the confidence that I do. Why I have the spirit about basketball and life. And it, it's, it's special to know that I can represent the Davidson basketball program up here today on this podium. Um, it's, a, it's a great day to be a Wildcat and I'll be forever living the, the TCC principle, trust, commitment, care that you taught me from day one. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for listening to Sports Legends of the Carolinas. You've just heard the first half of our conversation, but there's much more to come. Sometimes I, I have a day in which the reality doesn't set in. It's that I'm still coaching. I probably could have weathered another year or two or three, 
uh, but it wouldn't have been right. I think from the standpoint of do what is the best thing for Davidson, it was the best thing for Davidson College. For that, please purchase a premium subscription to our show exclusively on Apple Podcasts. And for video of these interviews, visit charlotteobserver.com slash sportslegends. Over a long number of years, Bob McKillop has put together a tremendous record to make Davidson. I'm Scott Fowler, and this is Sports Legends of the Carolinas. This show is produced by Jeff Siner and Kata Stevens, and the director of audio at McClatchy is Davin Coburn. For lots more content and to continue supporting this kind of work, please visit charlotteobserver.com slash sportslegends and consider a digital subscription. Connect with me on Twitter at Scott underscore Fowler or by email at sfowler at charlotteobserver.com. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you hear, please share with a friend. See you next week.